pay for more, baby. Will be done. 
he will, he will have whatever, whatever he says. says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you for your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. This is God's word. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. So why did Jesus curse the tree and cleanse the temple? This happened last week in our study. He comes in the great triumphal entry, the great coronation. Hosanna, which means in Hebrew, save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we know from Psalm 118 that this is the exact moment in history that that famous verse, 118.24, is meant to be stated and prayed and sung and proclaimed. Say it with me. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now say it every day. Say it often. Say it much. Say it about the day that He came in and saved this rotten soul and brought this dead heart to life. That's what I'll say this is the day. But it was the day the King came in, the Lord Jesus Christ. So last week he came to town. He cursed the fig tree. Why did he do that? Who remembers? Oh, he had no food all of it. And he was no, hungry and mad yeah. as ever. He saw the lush leaves. But he got closer and there's no fruit. So he saw the... <laughs> The pomp and pomposity <coughs> of the beautiful facade of religion. But he got closer, there's no fruit, there's no life, there's no sustaining nourishment from that tree. So he cursed it. He said, let no one ever eat from you again. Then he goes down into the temple, and he saw the same pomp, and he saw the same regalia and religious stuff, and all the ornate decorum, and all the priests and their dress, and their... It's the, you know, the sacrifices and all the temple and the gold and everything that Herod had restored Solomon's temple. And he saw no fruit. And his heart broke. Zeal for his father's house consumed him. It's, we're told in John 2, quoting the Old Testament. And what did he do? He cleaned house. The meek and mild son of David, seed of David. The one who will reign on the throne of David forever. He started overturning tables. He got violent. And we saw a fire. And he said, do not turn. This is a house of prayer. Don't turn it into a den of thieves. Don't, don't merchandise off my father's house. And so, righteous indignation. That's very good. And there's a place for that. And maybe we need a little bit more of that. And so here we have Christ. Coming back into town, look what it says. Now in the morning, verse 20. As they pass by. And so many things happen as they pass by. All these miracles happen just on the road, right? Here comes somebody. And a miracle now that is canonized in eternity happens. And people will see in heaven because they were just on the road, along the way, you know? Who knows who God will put along your road? As you pass by today, who knows who God will put in your path for you to share Jesus with. I know there's testimonies. I know there's testimonies. On your way here this morning. Interruptions. Divine interruptions. Right? So here you have, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Peter remembering. So this is a real cool thing. And maybe a little bit of a rare occasion where Peter actually remembered what Jesus said. And what Jesus did. Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi. Rabbi is a respectable term of honor that you would say to someone who is in authority. So it's a very strong term of respect. Rabbi, look. The fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Now why should Peter be surprised at this? That would be interesting thought. They said that it died from the roots up. The roots are the source of everything for the tree.
tree. Okay? So Jesus is our source. Without him, we would die, dry up, and yeah. wither. Yeah, okay, yeah. All right? Anybody else ever been surprised when God did exactly what he said he was going to do? Because that's exactly what happened here. And it was before Pentecost. Okay. But what about, what has God done in your life where he said he was going to do it, and he did it? And you're like, whoa! Yeah. Look, Lord! That happened. So, just a neat, just a direct, Jesus Christ said it, and it happened. Wow. Is that not enough? Is his word reliable? Is his word dependable? Is his word true? Because it either is or it isn't. There's no middle ground. There's no nuance. There's no gray area. Everyone tries to make things gray. Well, but he said it. He did it. It happened. The question is, do we believe his word? Do we? And so Jesus Christ answers Peter and the disciples with these words in verse 22. My favorite new verse in the Bible. This is what I love about studying the Word. You find these verses and they find you. Right, Fred? You go, he's going to use this at the bus station because he, he's going to leave here. He's got to get out of here. He's, he's watching his watch. Why is he watching his watch? Because he's going to go down and win souls at the bus station. And he's going to use these four words right here. Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. Four life-changing words. Everyone say those words with me. Have faith in God. Those are the four words Jesus responds to Peter with. So, what does it mean to have faith in God? Everybody, anybody. Trust. How do those words hit your soul? Trust. Have faith in God. Trust. 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 Thank you. Yeah, what is faith? Yeah. Okay. Also, don't have faith in yourself. Yeah. Trust God. Very good. That's right. Yeah. The object of your faith. We're going to find out that that is the most important part of those four words. But to have is important. The word have is something you have. It's something you possess. It's something you exercise. It's something you realize. It's part of your cognizance. It's part of your awareness. It's central to this whole word here. Ralph's got something. Yeah, so trust is the action word for faith. You can't faith something. I didn't faith something yesterday, but I trusted God yesterday. I trust Him tomorrow. I can't faith Him tomorrow. I didn't faith Him yesterday. So trust is the action word for faith. Yeah, very good. And Hoover had something to do. <laughs> Trust, faith, faith. Uh, Hebrews 11 tells us, what does it say? His priest has sent me a text that this is more in the morning before. <laughs> it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith, I love the word trust. What are other, some other ways we describe faith? What is faith, everybody? Believing. Believing, Roger. Faith. Faith is the word spoken believe after the pod like Abraham. Wow. Okay, yeah. yeah, he didn't even know where he was going, right? What's the chapter on faith in the Bible? Who knows it? Okay. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. It's called the Great Hall of Faith. Great place to go to show people that we have so much, don't we? You know, it's interesting. 
Those guys had a lot bigger faith with so little. We have a lot smaller faith with so much. What you got, preacher, right there? and a hard descent, right? Where is, is it, you know, is it real? Is it just intellectual? Go ahead. we got to talk about Okay. Uh, Uh-oh. He's so says, stirred up. <laughs> says, uh, faith is the hope of substance seen and the evidence yeah. of the things not yeah. seen. That's right. Yeah, Hebrews 11. He goes on to say, without faith, say it with you know it, it is impossible to please God. To please God. God. <laughs> For he that comes to him must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Seek him. So this is a faith, this is an act of faith. And the two words at the end of those four words are the most important. Thank you to uh, whoever said that back here. Maybe it's Rocky Ronnie. In God. I'm going to say in God. In God. In God. The object of our faith. Because Jesus said earlier, we studied it. Remember I brought those mustard seeds in? How little bitty those things are, you can't even see it. Rick can't even see a mustard seed with glasses from way back there. They're tiny. So you can have a little bitty faith. You can have a little bitty umbrella. But guess what? It's all about having a big God. So how big is your God? Ralph, real quick, pop, pop. Yeah, so from the, our earliest memories, one of the first things we learned as little kids is toddlers, seeing is believing. And that's a lie, because when you have Jesus Christ, when you have the Holy Spirit in your heart, when you believe in God, you believe in the unseen. Wow. So seeing is believing, that's a lie from the devil. Okay. Yeah, uh, Larry, you got something, too. I was going to sit there and say, one thing about faith is that if you Okay, so we're going to go from, Jesus is going to go from speaking to the fig tree to speaking to the mountain. And we're going to get into how can faith move mountains. Don't forget those four words. By the way, y'all have learned a verse today. Have faith in God. What a great Bible verse. What a great thing to remember today. Somewhere, somewhere somehow, somewhere, for me it's going to be 10 a.m., I'm going to remember the words fat faith in God. Because I'm going to look at a project that's going to be absolutely impossible. It's about two miles from here. And I'm going to say those words. I'm going to ask God to do a miracle. And every one of you guys has an impossible situation. What did the Hebrews use? Their rabbis, their scribes, their prophets. What did they use? What analogy or metaphor did they use to describe impossibilities? Who knows? Starts with an M, ends with an N. Mountain or mountains. So guess what? Rabbi Jesus used here the same thing. Look at this verse 20. It's all right here, verse 23. For assuredly I say to you. So that's just Jesus Christ putting a punctuation on what he's about to say. He's saying, pay attention. Tune in. Assuredly I say to you, whoever says, by the way, whoever is such an important word. Whoever is, I love that. It's in John 3, 16. Whosoever believes. He's inviting all of us into this journey. Of faith. No one is excluded. He's inviting everyone in. Now will everyone receive him? Will everyone exercise faith? Will everyone follow him? No, they're about to execute him just in a few days from this moment on in Holy Week. But whoever, this is a call, says to this mountain. There's the mountain right there. <clears throat> be removed and be cast into the sea. Now, don't forget the geographical. Don't forget the historical. Okay, don't jump over here, all the way over here, into the Occidental thinking of our mind, our culture, from the Oriental thinking of what was happening two thousand years ago. Where were they, gang? They were either on or they were either approaching the Mount of Olives, going back into the city, going back into the temple area in Jerusalem, and from that perch. What could you see? I'll give you a clue. It wasn't a lot. 
The Dead Sea. So now you got a dead tree right there. No fish. You got a dead sea way off in the distance. And they're on this mountain of olives, okay? <clears throat> so there's a whole lot. So it's kind of like Jesus is using imagery from like life. They're like saying, okay, here we are. It's not about fruit. It's not about trees. It's not about seas. It's not about mountains being removed. Well, they're on one, and it's big. And who would have thought about moving a mountain? No one can do that. It's impossible. So he says, be removed and cast in a sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. This little phrase here, does not doubt in his heart. What is doubt? Unbelief. The chief impediment of faith is doubt. And that comes up here. Does not doubt in his heart. Anybody in here ever have doubts? <laughs> Jesus said to his disciples on many occasions, in different ways, one way at time he said it this way, O ye of little faith. Little faith. He said it after doing great miracles. They're hungry again. And they had doubts after seeing him multiply bread to thousands. He said, if you have not any doubt. So what is doubt and why is doubt so damaging? And how does doubt attack us on every front? Anybody, everybody. Right here, Ralph. Yeah, I don't know. My, I'm, 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 <laughs> Ralph's on fire today, guys. Ralph, that's on fire. That's on fire. That's on fire. But it, uh, it shows the power of our words. Yeah. Our words, are, our words are important. Our words have power. Do we believe that our word actually has power? So in the previous uh, scripture verse, we uh, learned that Jesus cursed that tree. And just by speaking that, the power of his word destroyed that tree, killed it from the roots up. Do we believe that our words have the power to bless or to curse? Another, since we were toddlers, you know, they, right. sticks and stones will break my bones, but they will never hurt me. Yeah. That's not true, because the Bible says our words have meaning. Yeah. And so we have the power to curse or uh, bless and move mountains. Do we believe that? Yeah. Okay, good word. So, life and death are in the power of the tongue. A lot of things going on there. Read James 3. The same power to curse and the same power to bless. But the power ultimately is, I would contend, not so much in my words, not so much in that, but in the, in the God who I serve. And it's my faith in His power. And the words are just simply giving air, vocalizing the faith that's in my heart to call upon the Lord and call upon what He's going to do. And just trust Him. Catch up. This is a testimony on uh, faith and doubt. Uh, we went to India, and there was a tremendous famine, and, and here was a lady who came from Texas. She was about as old as me. You know, she, she rode the front seat everywhere, but here she is, and they go to this huge landowner's farm, and the place was drying up. I mean, it, the famine was upon them. Uh, on every little fence post, they had a Hindu god, 300 million Hindu gods in, in India. And he had called on them for rain, for rain, for rain, for rain. And she went and shared Jesus. Talk about faith versus doubting. And she said, I, I'm here to tell about the one true living God, Jesus Christ, uh, and, 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 and his Father, and the Holy Spirit. And, and he says, you know, your God, I have 300 million gods. Why would I believe your God? She looked at him. She said, my God can bring rain. <laughs> he looked at her. He said, if your God can bring, bring rain, I believe in your God, not my God. She said, by tomorrow, my God will bring rain. She got in the car and went back home. What did I do? Down. <laughs> What did I do? Oh, but it's fine. And so she calls back to Texas, Dallas, Texas. She's from a big church there, and the whole church began to pray. 
And another church began to pray because when you're on mission over there, churches all over the world are praying for what's taking place. Well, guess what? She got up the next day, so they headed out towards that, that, that estate. But on the way, here's a little cloud. Here's a big cloud. And it began to pour. It was a gully wash. <laughs> she got out of that car, she walked up to that guy, and she said, My God. My God. And he prayed to receive Jesus and all his family. Amen. Mountain moving faith. When's the last time you asked God to do something absolutely impossible? When's the last time you asked God to do something absolutely impossible? Today. Because we can go back and we can look in the rearview mirror, which, by the way, the last time I checked that rearview mirror is a lot smaller than that windshield. So, what else? Tell me what mountains are in your life. I'm talking impossibilities. This person, I could never be reconciled with this person. This person will never trust Christ as their Savior. This country will never turn back to God. Kaleem's got something right here. What are mountains? Say it out loud. What are your mountains in your life right now? Oh, no, that is an excellent mountain that Rather than there, I think that the Tatar, the Tatar, the Tatar, How many mountains recorded he actually moved? Man. Zip. Mountain is a metaphor. Right. <clears throat> Powerful story. Powerful truth. The question is this. Is there anything too small or too big for our God to move? No. Is there anything God cannot do? Is anything impossible God cannot overcome? So think about that thing in your life right now which seems... Absolutely impossible. Unless there's a breakthrough, this thing is is done. This person, there's no way they're going to trust Christ. There's no way they're going to believe. There's no way this most hardened, crooked politician is ever going to get saved. Which is what they said of Chuck Colson. The most nefarious, dark, deceptive lawyer in a corrupt administration and embroiled in the Watergate. He goes to prison and everyone's like, yeah, he got his. And all the Christians are like, man, that guy, shame on him. Man, he's going to rot in prison. Well, let me tell you what happened. He found Jesus in prison. Amen. And he started one of the largest prison ministries to ever exist. Prison fellowship. Thousands of inmates right now, this minute, are on their knees in prisons, in some of the worst prisons across America and the world, because of Chuck Colson and the mountain-moving faith of someone who prayed for him and God transforming his life. Amen? Amen. And that's the power of our God. So here you have this deal here. How can faith move mountains? I want you to write down on your sheet of paper. Write down. Write in a foreign language. You don't want anyone to see it. But you should probably write it in the known tongue so that we can pray for you. Write your mountain down. This is, gonna ha this is God right here. This is a, a God-moving mountain moment. This is a half faith in God impossibility that I need God to break through and do in a mighty way right now. Write the, write the name of someone down who's lost. Who you have, by the way, 
If you want to get convicted, go listen to my buddy, you know, Pastor J.D. said this on the radio. And I've heard other pastors say it. If God answered every one of your prayers today, your impossible prayers, if He answered every one of those things today, what would, what would, the, you know, what would happen? If God saved every lost person you prayed for today by name to be saved, who would get saved? Awkward silence. How many lost people have I prayed for today? How many people have I gotten on my knees before Almighty God and said, God, save this man. Save this family member. Save these people. David Livingston said, God, give me Africa. David Livingston died. How did he die? On his knees, praying for Africa. William Carey, the father of the modern missionary movement, prayed, God, give me India. He goes to India. He ends the burning of the widows, a horrific thing they did. He ended that. And souls now are being saved all over India. Churches are being planted today in India. People are being martyred for their faith in India and across the globe because of that kind of faith. Asking God to do the impossible. Because He's the God of the possible. Because that's how great our God is. So, what kind of faith moves about? Write that thing down. Go to God about it. Grab a guy to gate. Two or three gather together. And, and start, let's start asking God to move and do that. Now, look at here. This is where it gets tough. You're like, okay, you know, move mountains. Yeah, big thing. Big job problem. Uh, financial issue. Well, let's get real. Let's get in here. Okay, let's get in here. What does Jesus say? He really gets us convicted. Whenever, whatever, look at verse 24. I don't think we've read this. Therefore, I say to you, whenever you ask, when you pray, prayer is so important. When you pray, everyone say when. When, when you, you pray, pray. Believe. Everyone say believe. Believe. That you receive them and you will have them. This is prayer that's expected. Everyone say expected. 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 Now when you say that word, you think of what? You think of a, a new mom who's expected. The entire world orbits around that which orbits out of her stomach, right? That child that's coming. That baby's coming, and if you let someone know too early you're pregnant for the you know every waking hour, hey, when's the baby? Hey, when's the baby? Has the baby come yet? You know, if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you are there right now. Some of you got grandkids coming. It's like, where's the baby? Where's the baby? There's an expectancy. That's how we're to pray. We're, we're to pray in faith, not like a double-minded man, James 1. But let him ask in faith, not wavering, not doubting. Because see, the doubts is like the wave of the sea. It's driven to toss. Right. Do we really believe in God? Do we really trust Him to do great things? Are we expectant that God is going to deliver no pun intended. So you think about that. Praying expectantly, verse 25. This is where it gets tricky, sticky, and painful. And whenever you stand praying, very common to stand praying, also to kneel praying. Uh, so that's, that's not as significant here, but when you're praying, if you have anything against anyone. It's pretty broad, isn't it? Anything against anyone. Say those words with me. Anything, Anything against, against anyone. anyone. Forgive him. That your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. So I put the question here. Why is forgiveness, which literally that word forgiveness in the Greek simply means to give grace. To give something that's not deserved. Forgive. Why is forgiveness so important and so connected to prayer? The heart should be right. Okay, getting the heart right. Very good. Anyone else? To be like God. Okay. Okay, yeah, because God forgives. Am I like Him? Go. The first mention of forgiveness in the Bible <clears throat> is Joseph. Mm. Okay. God blessed Joseph immensely because even before he met his brothers and family he already forgave them and that's the power of forgiveness yeah. okay forgiveness uh, gross close I have cherished sin in my heart wow yeah the Lord would not have for a couple of verses earlier, it's a major impediment to our prayers. Go, speak. 
It said, Lord, teach us to pray. He told him in the prayer, forgive us our trespasses yeah. as we forgive those who trespass against us. Pretty good example. Yeah, okay. Very good. Jesus made it really easy, by the way. He made it really easy, but he made it really hard. Because we're, now we're opening up a whole lot of stuff here. Because there's some pain right now in this room. And there's someone you won't even look in the eye, you won't even talk to. And the thought of that person coming into your mind right now really annoys you, irritates you. I don't want to deal with that. Okay? So forgiveness is inextricably connected to fellowship with God. And it will hinder, and it will turn into a root of bitterness to the point where Jesus said in Matthew 6, He says, when you go to the altar... When you go to the sacrifice, when you go to the worship, if you have ought, if you have ill will, if you have lack of forgiveness, if you have a barrier with you and someone else, an issue, an offense, leave your sacrifice at the altar and go to your brother and be reconciled with your brother. And then come back. Because... That's the when, when God brings us into harmony with Himself through forgiveness. Through Luke 3, 23, 34. <clears throat> Father, Jesus said from the cross, His first words from the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. When He brings us into harmony, when He brings us and He forgives us our debts, what does He do? He creates a path of grace that flows to us, that flows through us to others to forgive those who have offended us. To forgive those, the early church had to kill, had to forgive Saul, who murdered their family, who murdered fellow Christians. Jamal's got something in Jeff. Quick. Okay, well, all right. Let's go. Let's break. Uh, I just want to say it's kind of interesting that today I have a long drive in here and I pray forgiveness. And this is really touching me. Yeah. Yeah. We're on this subject. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, man, get around him. Praise the Lord. And what he said, and he shared through tears, there's forgiveness and unforgiveness we all struggle with. Hey, this isn't easy, is it? This isn't easy. There's pain. And there's offense. And there's people that really have done you wrong. And guess what? There's people that you did wrong. And there's people that think you did them wrong when you think they did you wrong. And you're probably both wrong. And you ain't never going to talk. Well, let me tell you something. If you don't talk, if you don't get that right, guess what you are? Guess what I am if that's me? I'm a fig tree with a bunch of leaves but no fruit. I'm a temple with a bunch of chaos and a bunch of re religious regalia and gold and ornate thrones and altars, but no heart of God. Because when when there's unforgiveness and it festers, it is a cancer. Yeah. And it's like the guy said, you know, was it C.S. Lewis or someone said, it said maybe Chesterton. I always give credit to Chesterton with a quote you don't know who said it. He said, unforgiveness is like pouring a, a, a cup, a, a, you know, a drink of poison for your enemy and drinking it yourself. Because it goes in and corrupts unforgiveness. And so Jesus is saying, don't, he's saying, deal with this right here, right now. Because I want to do great mighty things, but your unforgiveness is holding you back. And so thank you, Jeff, for sharing. Roger's got something on that. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that when you forgive, you free your spirit. Yeah. When you free your spirit, you're open to listen. Right. Jesus said, I do, no, I do nothing, I do nothing, except that I hear the Father speak. Mm. And so when we hear, hear we can hear the Lord speak, then we can walk out on faith, because He has spoken, it's not our own imagination. Yeah. Only if you have been forgiven do you have the power to forgive. And, you know, First John, John, John who heard Jesus say this, John was with the twelve on the mount. Hearing Christ talk about this, hearing these very words, he uh, he said in First John, he said that he said if you forgive your if you cannot forgive your brother who you can see, how can God forgive you? And I'm going to read the exact verse here. Excuse me. If a man say I love God and hateth his brother, he's a liar. 
For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Some of the impossible mountains right here, right now, in this room, are mountains of unforgiveness. Yeah. And you can't bear this burden alone. And some of those names that God brought to your heart that you prayed for, Jeff, you need to you guys need to pray together after this and let him help you carry that. Because that's what that's why he said bear each other's burdens. That's why we're the body of Christ. Because this is tough stuff. And we need to pray for each other in that. And guess what? Tomorrow, you're going to be upset with one of those people again. And you just have to go back to the cross. And daily, it's the daily walk. It's growing grace. Allowing Him in to that painful stuff. Romans 12, 19 says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Yes. He will exact His vengeance in His time. And this doesn't mean that you, 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 it doesn't mean that you loan the guy another, you know, m a bunch of money right. who, who robbed you. It doesn't mean you're, you know, but it, but it means that you are at peace with God and you don't harbor resentment bitterness for that person. Okay, Jamal's got one right quick there. What I wanted to say um, earlier was about how somebody might be speeding on the highway and you want to put hand signals and curse about and all that. Well, to get our heart right, that person might have been speeding to give birth to somebody. And we're sitting there right. mad and upset. That person that we know in our family is always mad and cursing out folks. Wow. That person might have had some kind of hurt in their past that we don't know about. Mm. So that is how we can pray for somebody else. We might be going through something. And to be honest, we're all going through something. But if I were to pray for somebody else and we don't know the situation, we can ask God to change our heart to get our heart more so in tune with what their needs are. Did uh, we do, don't we not need forgiveness in this country for what this country's done to certain people? Did Mandela not have forgiveness for his country? And look at the power of that, and that turnaround happened in South Africa. So it happens on an individual level, happens on a nation, nationwide level, happens on a global, global level. So power and forgiveness, power and prayer, it's amazing. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 Yes, sir. Amen. Uh, illustration of this, best one I ever heard. A little louder than that, back in the back. We were in Phoenix, Arizona, getting ready to do a chapel service. There was about uh, 200 people sitting out there, and Michael Walton was supposed to pray that day. But he had laryngitis, and coming out of there, he asked Darrell Walter if he would pray, and Darrell said, sure, he was always praying. So he sits down, and he gets up, and he turns around, and he sees Ricky Craven. Ricky Craven had taken him out when Darrell was leading a race about five weeks before. Two weeks before that, Darrell was leading the race, and Craven took him out a second time. Max Elton, the chaplain, went up and holler with Darrell and said, hit me. And Darrell said, I'm not going to hit you, I'm going to hit Craven. <laughs> <laughs> he said, he said, no, hit me, it'll ruin your testimony. No. So he didn't do that, but they never talked about it. And so Darrell is sitting there. Ricky is sitting on the front row with his wife and kids. And Daryl comes up there and turns around and he sees Ricky. And he pauses. Pauses a long time. And he calls Ricky up there beside him. And says, I am all against you. I haven't called you. I hate you for the last five weeks. And I want you to forgive me. This, this is a, by the way, this is the, the, the grander purpose of this forgiveness. Because what that does, that unlocks the gospel to go out to people. Because all I'm doing, hey, I'm a forgiven one inviting others into the forgiveness of God. That's all a believer is. He forgave me. That's why we have 532 of Ephesians. Be kind, one to another. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. The gospel comes and forgives. Believers, true Christians, that have the leaves and the fruit coming out, are forgiven. 
And then we are in the beautiful and the glorious privilege of inviting others into the forgiveness of God. No matter how bad you screwed up, no matter who you messed up or gotten under or wrecked or, you know, wrecked or your life is a train wreck, God can forgive you. God can heal you. God can do what Isaiah said. Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be white as snow. Herb's got something on that too. I got a quotation. <coughs> Never be afraid to apologize. Remember, there was only one in the world who was perfect. Yeah. Yeah, very good. And that follows follow it up with a C.S. Lewis quote, one of my favorites. He said, To be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable. Because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. And so you have this whole idea of faith at the very end. You do not, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. So this is clear, this is critical. And this is difficult, and this is real, and this is messy. So, final question, guys. We are out of time. Everybody stand up. <clears throat> I've got a whole lot more. And we're, we're, we're coming back next week to the issue of authority. But here you have Jesus, guys. We, we have Jesus talking about the power of faith, the power of prayer. <clears throat> and you have these final questions. What miracle of forgiveness has God worked in you? Now think about that. Because when you start to think about that person, you're having a hard time forgiving. Think about the miracle of forgiveness. Why should God have forgiven you? What did you deserve to have him forgive you? But what are the implications of that? You were bound to hell and God forgave you. Now you're bound to heaven. You were under the object of his wrath. Now you are under the absolute flow of his lavished on with his love and affection. That is the beauty of it. So, and then the, here's the final question <clears throat> How are you believing God for the impossible? What are you trusting Him for? And it could be connected to that forgiveness thing because that is a very difficult area. And I put a bunch of verses here. Please go read these verses. But I love that question, how big is your God? I love what Jerry Bridges said. You heard, you heard this before. He said, he said, the smaller your God is, the bigger your problems are. <laughs> well, what's the converse? What's the opposite of that? The bigger your God is, the smaller your problems become. I love going to the Energized headquarters in Walburn, North Carolina. Why do I like going in there and looking at that wall? What's on that wall, Joel? What's prayer, on that wall? Prayer wall, man. Prayer walls. All the stuff over the years that has been prayed there and answered. There's a prayer wall where people will write. What do they do? Just tell them real quick. This yeah, is no, people come in and say, I got this problem, I got this burden, or whatever it happens to be. And I'll write it on the wall, and then we'll come back years later to see what God has done. And then yeah, there's some pretty, pretty crazy stuff. Up so there. you go in there, guys. You go in there, and you, you say, Bower socks, man, I can't deal with this. The, the, the church is falling apart, and I'm struggling. I've got issues with my marriage. Bower socks says, get in here. Here's a pen. Here's a marker. Right on this wall, that prayer request. And then, the, and then you come back later, and you share what God did to answer that prayer. And what do you do? You write it right back on that wall, right? Put your date on there. So I'm going to tell you about a date. We're done. January 8, 1956. What happened? Do not forget this date, please. Please do not forget this date. January 8, 1956. Five men, after praying for God to do the impossible, what was the impossible to Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, and their other three friends, these missionary guys that love Jesus, that instead of going off to a big, booming financial career in America, they went to the mission field. Their prayer was that God would reach them, through them would reach the Aka Indians, an unreached, mission, an unreached tribe of rough, rough people that prided themselves on murdering and executing neighboring tribes, anyone that came near them. No one had gone in there. The gospel had never been there. They had never heard about Jesus. And these men finally, after dropping a lot of stuff from an air trap, a lot of food and supplies and gifts, they finally landed in the Aqua Indians area. They landed on, on, a, on a, sand, a big sandbar on the river to reach them. 
And they came out of the woods. And they came out of the woods with spears. And they killed these men. Martyred these men. 1956. Now listen to this. These men were armed with firearms. And they had told their wives before that they weren't going to shoot if they were attacked. Because they knew they had heaven waiting for them. They knew they'd been forgiven. But they knew this tribe had never had never, no hope of heaven and never heard of Jesus. So they, they discharged their firearms in the air. And so this was horrible. Imagine being the widow. Imagine getting the call when the reconnaissance team, the air, you know, the air team came and they saw all that bloody mess and they, they gathered bodies. Imagine being Elizabeth Elliot, these women, women who are hearing about your husband slain in service to the gospel. What did they do? How did they respond? Did they go back home? Did they drown in their tears? Did they say, I'm done with the Lord, I'm walking away? No, here's what happened. They started praying. They said, Lord, give us this tribe. We want to reach them for Christ. They went back. And a little girl who escaped the cruelty of that village came to them and they led her to Christ. And she went back to that village. And then she came back and brought them back in the village. And through all that, to make a long story short, the whole village came to Christ. And the miracle is manifest and it's, it's demonstrated in a baptism. Because Nemo became the senior pastor. Little bitty Nemo. He became the senior pastor of the church that they planted. And not too many years later, Nemo baptized Stephen Saint, the son of Nate Saint, who was executed in that same river. Yeah. He baptized him right there. And Nemo was one of the men with the spears who murdered those missionaries. That is the power of the gospel. To go out. And God wants to send every one of you out to spread this amazing news about a Savior who came and died for me. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And we can become His righteousness. And there's an addendum to that. After that happened, there's a record amount of missionaries around the world that became missionaries. Yeah. It set off a wave of young people around the world saying, I want to go. Leaving careers, leaving everything, leaving family. I want to go to the ends of the earth. I want to reach the world with the gospel. And may that happen today, gang. Let's pray that that would happen today. And maybe someone in this room, well, not maybe, if you know Jesus, you are commissioned to go tell one person a day before your head hits a pillow about the glorious saving of Jesus Christ. Kaleem's going to close in prayer. Quick, Come on up, Kaleem. Quick, quick. Come, 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 come. We're leaving on the 9th of Tunisia. <clears throat> Tunisia. On the 9th of September, oh, wow. we're going to Tunisia. We have a spot for one or maybe two people. You guys interested? Talk to me after a little bit. Okay. Yeah. And Kaleem, will you close in prayer and just pray this out? Yes, Lord, uh, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for this man of God. Uh, Brother Sue, thank you for uh, the legacy of the Ambersons in the city and beyond. Lord, just bless us. Thank you for the word that we heard today about forgiveness. It's a great weapon against bitterness, Lord. And help us to move fast and move forward, Lord. We thank you that we can move mountains, Lord. We thank you for, for the forgiveness that you gave us, Lord. Uh, let us walk in it every day, Lord, and humble ourselves because we are a bunch of sinners, Lord. And we thank you for, uh, for uh, these men, these powerful men in this room. I know many, many of them. We thank you, Lord, for the city, Winston-Salem. No matter what happened, Lord, if we are, if we love you, God, if we walk with you, God, you're going to be with us, and we are able to move mountains. Lord, we pray for the political atmosphere and the division that we have in this country, Lord. We just, you are our king, and you are sovereign, and you love this country, the USA, Lord. We just ask you to protect this place. Bring you the blood of Jesus in this place. We pray that in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Pray with one person before you leave. Uh. Yeah, thank you.